Hang on a sec. Okay. You really gobbled this cookie. <laughs> Man, I was so hungry. <laughs> Would it really classify as gobbled though? <laughs> nom 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 nom. Mm, that was really good. And 7-Eleven has the little freshies. I have picked the freshies for you. Did you go to the back of the bin? Mm -hmm. I was like, reach back. That's love. Yeah. <laughs> That's love. <laughs> Okay, hit it. Hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog and the lovely Laura Morgan, and it's Q and A, A. Saturday. <laughs> right. Number, where are we at? 13. Yay. Awesome. Well, we're stacking up, guys. Hopefully you guys can see what the... Uh, Big glare coming um, yeah. down the line. Is it okay? It makes us look angelic. I'm just going to trim this just a little bit so it's more me. Good. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, guys, we're back. Um, Again. And so bear with me because I'm snacking. Um, but uh, so last week, so you'll be getting this one hopefully. When, when do you think this one it's will uploading. hit? uploading. No, this one though. Oh, this one will go this weekend, tomorrow. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So... Excuse me, guys. Um, so the la the last one, it, we got caught up a little bit because of uh, travel and everything like that. So you'll probably be getting that what to to tomorrow tomorrow. tomorrow. We'll so you get like a two. double shot. Yeah. So it'll be the first ever. Um, uh, I was gonna say T three. First ever Q and A Saturday. Excuse me. Wow. How inappropriate. Let's go. Sorry, it's bubbly stuff. Um, first Q and A double uh, double shot. So mm -hmm. you don't want to hear any of this. No, we got to I'm go. trying to engage with them, and all you want to do is you just We engage with them in. with the info. I've got work to do. I thought this was supposed to be like a friendly show rather it than It is like, friendly. Here, take your answers. Get out of here. It's friendly and it's that. It's two things. It's very she, European. She's she's a little, a little focused today, which is good. Which is good. Got all a right. lot of stuff to do. Okay. okay. But so, you love everybody. Love you. Okay. Question number one. Number one. We've got... Gaggy Lee? Gaggy Gee. Gaggy Gee. Gaggy G. Um, Gaggy asks, out of the four pups, let's go with Sparky. <laughs> How can I help my four-year-old to stop resourcing, resource guarding, I guess, me from the yeah. other dogs? She stands between me and the dog and also begins to circle the dog. I remove her as I'm unsure if it'll escalate, plus I don't want her to think the behavior's okay. She does it before, oh no, before eating, getting leashed, being pet, she has to sit, which uh, takes a few commands, but I don't allow until she obeys. I ignore her when she initiates play. She can only get on the furniture if I call her. Gaggy G. Okay. Um, guarding you is, is no bueno. Um, uh, I would say, first off, a dog that's doing any shenanigans like that should not have any furniture privileges. Mm -hmm. And that furniture privilege makes me wonder about if there's lap privileges and, and things like that. Um, it's real easy for dogs that have, excuse me, these tendencies to, um, to take an inch. Uh, what is it? Take a take, mile. Give an inch, take give, a mile. <laughs> uh, to take advantage would be, would be yeah, better. So um, if you've got a dog with a propensity for this, you kind of have to treat them a little bit differently. Um, I'd say that it's probably a mixed message and probably confusing and probably will cause your dog to make bad choices if you're allowing furniture, um, ready, free access to, to your personal space, and a lot of unearned affection will probably guarantee you more of this behavior. So if you're really looking to get rid of that, then I would X... X... X nay on the X, <laughs> furniture pay. Yeah, uh, what she said. And uh, I'd be very conscious about um, affection, um, Unearned affection especially, but even earned affection, I would keep it at a minimum. Um, I would do lots of foundation work, and a lot of folks don't don't even see the, the connection, but I would be busting that dog's behind on a lot of foundation work in the house, a lot of duration work away from you. So teaching the dog that it's not about, it, it's not able to guard you. If the dog's in place across the room, it can't guard you. Um, so I would be doing, not as an avoidance technique, but just psychologically getting the dog into a space where Oh, mom's here and I'm over here. And it's none of my beeswax. What's mm. going on with the other dogs? Mm -hmm. So foundation work, um, some household management as far as like the way you're engaging and what access you're allowing the dog. And then specifically for any kind of negative behavior towards the other dogs, even if the dog's in place or when it's out of place, if it's um, staring, 
um, you know, like mad dogging the other dogs or posturing or any of the precursors before, it, you know, this, this guarding stuff, um, then I correct that stuff. So leash and prong uh, on your dog, dragging around when you are home supervising and you're sitting on, on your couch and you see your dog across the room in place, mad dogging your other dog, no, and which is a marker for it, calmly walk over, pop the leash, let the dog know, I disagree with that, knock it off, we don't want any. Um, we're not buying. Um, pet corrector could also work for that, um, but the pet corrector will cor correct generally, not specifically towards the one dog. So all your dogs may feel freaked out. Um, but if you don't, if you don't have access to a, a, a leash and prong, or not a leash and prong, but a prong collar, or if you're not into it, then you can try pet corrector. Um, but like I said, you'll get a general uh, correction rather than specific. So I would go with leash and prong. And if you want to get super fancy and, and really get into things in e collar training with a, with a with someone to help guide you into that, would be a, a great solution. Yeah. And that is what I had to say about that. Oh, nice. Thanks, Gaggy. Okay, question number two. This comes from Julia and Capone. Okay. Two and a half weeks ago, I adopted a four-year-old Dachshund rescue, mm -hmm. or Dachshund. Dachshund rescue. He's having awful separation anxiety when I crate him. I've tried suggestions of Kong with peanut butter, item of my clothing in the crate, toy or bone that he loves. Nothing is working. He won't touch any of it until I return and open the crate. When I leave, I hear him barking when I return as well. Will he ever adjust, and what else can I do? I also got a calming treat from the vet for him. Okay. Uh, Julie Capone. So separation anxiety is a pretty common um, challenge for a lot of folks, especially rescue dogs. A lot of these dogs have had, you know, challenging situations and uh, so not a lot of consistency, a lot of stress, things like that. Um, so, can you Hercules. do anything about that? Do you guys hear that warbling in the distance? If you guys listen, if you crane your necks, you'll hear... Silence. <laughs> Thanks, Hercules. Her dog dreams so loud. Mm. I'm sure it'll it'll start back up again. It mm. cycles. Okay, so um, Julia, Julianne. I'm the pig. Um, it's dreaming. So, first of all, I do some foundation work with this dog. Um, so separation anxiety. You wanna you wanna not just try and tackle that one little moment. Um, I would be going after. Um, I'd be going, is, is the dog crated, she said? Yeah. And breaking out of the crate? No, not no. breaking out, but just barking when she leaves and when barking. she comes back. Okay. Yeah. So we have a few separation anxiety questions in this one. So um, I wrote a few notes, and one is foundation work for you, definitely. Um, that dog should be practicing when you're home, um, emotional and physical space from you. Um, if that dog is allowed to be on the couch, in your lap, getting a lot of affection, and then you go to leave, put him in the crate, um, then that's absolutely going to be a mm -hmm. huge challenge for that dog to, to cope. So what we're trying to do is create less contrast, uh, less of a dramatic contrast for when you leave. We're trying to create the perception of distance and space emotionally and physically prior to departure, um, more in a general sense of lifestyle. So your dog feels um, more, more, is more adapted and comfortable with that, with that process. What are you, what are you up to over there? Are you surfing? No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So um, let's see, uh, what else do I have? So emotional, physical space, um, be highly conscious of affection. I think I mentioned that. Um, and then I would go for a no bark collar, um, which is the, the only way really to correct that stuff when you're not around. So there's a few different um, bark collars. Um, I wouldn't, I absolutely wouldn't get one from Petco or PetSmart, any of the big box um, versions. They're really bad. Um, I would either get a sport dog um, you can try e-collar technologies and we're dog. trying e-collar technologies yeah. just came out with a new bar yeah, collar a brand new version that, that we're, we're trying out real soon uh, or the dog tra. so those are three that I'd take a look at and you can do your own research on Amazon um, all three of them make great products and then you kind of have to figure out what you want um, but if you've got a dog that's barking in your absence and you don't have any way to correct because you're not there, the dog is going to most likely continue to cycle and work himself up and, and it's just going to be this continual, you know, 
traumatic process. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks are nervous about a bark collar, but if a bark collar actually causes the dog to relax and break that cycle, it's actually a very humane uh, um, alternative to a dog just stressing and, and, and being locked in, ang in an anxious cycle um, over and over and over perpetually. So um, just to review, um, lots of foundation work. Uh, just go to my website, www.thegooddog.net and click on our free uh, do-it-yourself videos and start going through those videos of, of heel, sit, down, place, lots of duration work with this dog, get him to just hang in place for long periods of time with you not connected to him, get him used to you not being like this with him, um, and uh, no couch, none of that stuff, and that doesn't have to be forever, but for right now, you really want to try and break that, that, mm -hmm. that desperate kind of feeling that the dog has when, when you leave. And so we're trying to approximate some of that even when you're present. And then a no bark collar um, would be a suggestion. Don't put it on the auto setting. I'm, I'm not a fan of auto setting where the, the collar escalates automatically. Just pick a, pick a setting, um, start low. And then um, if you're fancy and you can, um, you know, like you use a, a you know, baby monitor or something you can you can film and, and see what your dog's reaction is um, or you can ask your neighbors and then if the dog is still barking then you can up at one level and then do the same thing and check in or you can just walk out the door that's a, a, a lo-fi version uh, put it on your dog walk outside the door or walk outside the room shut the door and listen and see you know what your dog's reaction is you don't want to you really don't want to preferably leave with the bark collar on and not be there present in case the dog's got a negative reaction or right. is panicking or anything like that. So that's a, a good addendum to that is make sure you do that when you are present so you can um, so you can see how your dog's reaction is and then address it uh, appropriately. Start low and then work yourself up. Okay, question three, Karen Thompson. Sean and Laura, my male GSD is dog reactive. What? <laughs> We live on a cul-de-sac with almost really? every what? house on the block having dogs. I can't take him out for a walk without a reaction. Hackles up, huffing, tense, not focused, almost the second we walk out the door. In this case, there's no catching it and correcting it before there's a reaction. I walk with a prong and I've also worked on the e-collar heel. I make him wait at the door. We've gone out the back door and through the fence again, waiting to exit, uh, waiting to exit for the state of mind. I've considered crittering as he's so reactive, not dog aggressive because he lives with another dog. Not that I want him to go to meet other dogs. I just want to take him for a walk and have him ignore. How would you handle this? I do not know anyone else who has a balanced dog to practice with. Um, he's Another problem is in another location, he's stranger reactive. He's gotten better with that, but mo mostly you know, dog people react to okay. stuff. Um, so, all right, so this is Karen Thompson. Mm -hmm. So Karen, uh, yeah, that's such a common one we see with so yeah. many shepherds. Um, yeah. Man, it's a tough one. Yeah, there's so, a lot of foundation in that. Getting those guys to just calm down and actually listen and not act on their impulsive, like, like knee jerk yeah. reaction stuff, and also like that dog waiting at a threshold. Sorry, I just jumped no, in. no, you just brought shepherd up. shepherd time. Waiting at a threshold is so different for a, a for any dog, you know, than than getting a higher level correction going through the door at the threshold to kind of set the tone. Um, the cool thing about these guys is they're typically pretty resilient, so you need pretty tough, yeah. pretty tough, yeah. yeah, yeah, like a lot of like just being on them and your corrections. Although you may be doing the e collar heel and you may be correcting for first stuff it may not be enough to get him to actually buy in. So use the threshold as your big thing. Like say your level on the walk for him looking at other dogs, you're correcting him at 20. Do 45 at the, at the threshold and see what you get. If, here to, if, it's not blowing, if 20 is not blowing his mind and not changing his state, you know? So working at that threshold first and then really, really, really being on him for every little tiny thing on the walk. But mainly with those guys, the, the calm, good stuff inside is, is the key. You yeah. Know? So I wrote down some similar notes. Um, she's a mind reader, right? So we're connected. Um, so foundation work inside the house, you, you can't, uh, and I, I think you're already doing some of that stuff, but I would be looking for what we typically do in, when we work in boarding trains that have that stuff is we're looking for other moments in the house um, in, in, with interior work here where the dog is blowing off a moment, where the dog is just on autopilot, which means he's just reacting to like, mm -hmm. I just feel this and I just go. And so I would be challenging him with distractions and uh, 
higher levels of, of challenges of, of, you know, fast movement and walking in out of the door and you should be able to go anywhere in the house and the dog doesn't move from place. If you can't get that going, then, then you've still got some work to do inside the house. Um, and then like what Laura was saying about thresholds, so there's a lot of different ways people do thresholds. People will walk up and they will have their dog sit at a threshold and wait and then they'll walk through first. The way we do it with reactive dogs, with any dog, but especially with reactive dogs, is we walk up, we give zero cues, I don't say a word, um, walk up right to the threshold and stop kind of like right on a dime. And if the dog moves anywhere past the heel position, it's a pretty firm correction for that. So the whole point of that, that exercise is that here's this threshold, which creates a lot of excitement and, and enthusiasm about what's coming up. And you're saying in the face of this excitement and enthusiasm, give me your best work. Mm -hmm. Do your work, not you, your dog. Do your work, which is I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to cue you. Um, you're, we're subtly cueing with the body, but we're not like spoon feeding the dog. I stop. You better do your work. If you're not doing your work because you're tuned out and already excited and, 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 and thinking about dogs and this and that and getting all worked up, then you're going to get a pretty firm correction. So that's a tweak um, on thresholds that uh, I don't see most people do. And uh, I think a lot of people feel, feel like it feels like it's a setup. And it is a setup. Mm -hmm. it, you're setting your dog up to do its best work. And if they're mm -hmm. not with the reactive dog, you're missing an opportunity to create leverage right there. And like Laura was saying, a higher level correction for that, which I have written down as well. Um, that's, we've seen, a, we've had a lot of success with um, owners that have had shepherds, especially that are dog reactive and protective and all that stuff. And setting the tone where you get the small version of what you're getting out with the dogs at a threshold. Or the first time you you know, you get through the threshold, your dog's a rock star, you start you start healing and your dog moves this much past the heel position and you nail him. Mm -hmm. Now it's not to be unfair, it's 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 saying if you've trained heel fairly, then your dog knows what heel is. Heel doesn't mean be an inch in front of me. That inch means that your dog is tuning out from you. And, and starting, you're starting to lose him and he's starting to listen to his own impulses and excitement. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you get that small little moment of, of infraction, bigger correction, which is another hard one for a lot of folks, right? They feel like it's a small infraction, so I'm gonna give a, a small consequence. But the reality is that small infraction is the beginning of the end. So if you don't go after that with something really firm, you actually lose this window. So this window opens up, he's, he's starting to get a little bit excited, and if you don't correct firmly enough and cap it and shut it down, then you're going to start to lose him and get to a point where you probably can't get him back. And that's really the difference, I think, between a successful reactive dog situation and one where, uh, you, where you lose the dog. So, um, so that, that would be some strategies. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, ba -ba 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 um, okay, yeah, and then also... As far as when you're actually on the walk, if you're nailing those those heel and the thresholds and they're looking really good, and then hopefully you've already created that state of mind, don't wait. It's not about a waiting game. It's not about like, I'll wait for 45 minutes before taking the dog out. That's why we set the dog up with thresholds in that sense. It's about the dog doing its best work rather than like waiting 45 minutes for the dog to calm down. So that's the state of mind I'm looking for is attentive state of mind, dog doing his work state of mind. Now, once you're out on that walk, and dog's healing, and the second you see hackles come up, huffing, the second, I don't mean like, is he gonna lift off? I mean, the second it shifts from mm -hmm. ears back and calm, you nail him. You go at a higher level and you shut that down. You have to cap that stuff. If if you don't, once again, you miss that moment and then that adrenaline builds and it's it's almost impossible to get your dog back. So that's that's kind of the secret with this stuff. And once again, it goes back to that unsavory concept for a lot of people, which is higher consequence, smaller infraction, which means higher consequence when the state of mind is doing the same thing, but at a lower level, so it doesn't have all that noise, so it doesn't hear what you're trying to say. So, so if you correct them when it's just at that lower level, but the same flavor, then the impact is much larger and your dog has the ability to grab all the information, process it and go, oh, I shouldn't be doing that, rather than all that noise of reactivity and now you're trying to like correct through that and that's a losing game. So, and then the last thing I would say is that um, you can also only feed on the walks around people and around dogs and um, 
just, I mean, you have to be really diligent that that's the only place, the only environment that your dog eats. You don't sneak him treats, you don't sneak him anything else. You correct, as soon as he gives you a calm state of mind and focus, feed, right? And so then you're teaching him that giving me this nice stuff is actually going to be the, the only way you eat and that will give, create a lot more leverage as well towards giving you what you want to where then you can eventually get off the pressure and have your dog doing uh, more work on his own. That is my very long answer to that. Okay, question three. No, question four. We're moving. Yeah, we are moving. This is from Kat Katrin mm. Mm. Jungling. Ow! Oh, come on. You. Hello from Austria. Hello, Katrin. Katrin, we miss you. Katrin's a girl. Good, good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And she is the, the, the chocolate diva. She's the chocolate connection. Whoa. That's a good name, Chocolate Diva. It is. She's the one when she shows up, she brings, she all, brings the all the goodies from Europe. She brings all sorts of yummy European chocolate. Oh, my favorite girl. I'm in, in Austria. Oh, in Austria. Okay. I waited for the Q&A already. Yeah, she waited. My little Westie Cheyenne is eating very fast, and two days ago I gave her some pieces of an apple, and one of them got stuck in her throat. Mm. I'm happy she survived, and I don't want it to happen again. Good grief. I know how you train when feeding a dog, but is there anything else I can do to make her eat slow and not only swallow her food? She has beautiful teeth, and I want her to use it when she's eating. <laughs> Thank you. Aww. Okay. Uh, Katrine, um, I would go with a really simple approach, which is just a slow feed bowl. And uh, I know that Cheyenne's a, a small, small Westie, um, but I just get a small, slow feed bowl. And you probably know what they are. Um, maybe you just haven't checked it out, or but they work really well. And they, they just, you know, they're bowls that have these like little, like, uh, I don't know what they they're are. They're like little, little like, right? It's a hard yeah, one to find a word stalagmites. for, right? Stalagmites, <laughs> stalactites. Um, little panels. Like, like a little maze inside there that makes it hard for your dog to just gobble. The dog has to really work to get the pieces of food out and it slows the whole process down. So that's what I do. You can go on to Amazon and just type in slow feed bowl mm -hmm. uh, for dogs. And um, I know there's a blue, there's kind of a really popular blue or green one um, a lot of people recommend. It's actually, I think it's, I think it's blue. Mm -hmm. um, check it out. And uh, that should slow down the process and get that little Cheyenne to use those pretty teeth. All right? <laughs> See ya. Okay. Question number five. This is from Kathleen. She says, hi, Sean and Laura. I have a two and a half year old rescue pit I got when she was eight months old. No training at all. I worked in a doggy daycare and they were big on click and treat, which worked great inside. Then she got bit at work twice and she bit back. Mm. We then moved to an over 55 community with a lot of small yappy dogs. She was impossible to walk, lunging, pulling, jumping. I hired a trainer who worked with a prong. Her feeling was uh, to let my pup go to the end of the collar and correct herself. It was horrible looking, but the walk is better with no distractions. Mm. But no luck with other dogs. I'm now working with an e-collar and a little confused to what to do when, when they see other dogs. The old trainer said to turn correct and then walk back to the dog, which is still not working. Do you suggest walking in the other direction? It's not always possible. There's a lot of dogs here. I've tried walking in an area with no distractions. She does great. Um, we, she comes back every time too when they go to a park and do a long line. Oh, call. great. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, Kathleen, right? Mm -hmm. Kathleen from Ragsdale. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Kathleen. Um, good for you doing all this work to try and get this, this rescue pity in line and and um i really applaud you it's it's it can be challenging work especially with a strong reactive dog so good good for you um great that you're on e-collar um i would definitely like this is kind of like the theme for this this show um i'd definitely be practicing um foundation work inside the house not just doing um not just doing e-collar on the walk but i would look i'd be looking to make sure that dog is the most well behaved highly obedient uber respectful um, young lady or young man inside the house and um, you can watch our videos and see what some of that stuff looks like like you know having the dog e-collar trained to play sit down recall and doing that inside the house mm -hmm. and creating a lot of structure in the house where your pity is sitting in one spot or in place and you're able to move anywhere and your dog doesn't budge no matter what you bring out food treats dance around vacuum dog doesn't move you can knock on the doors dog doesn't move you're looking for like 
fantastically high levels of responsiveness with recall and fantastically high levels of duration work staying in one spot and not moving no matter what is going on so if that's interior work i'd be leveraging that big time um and then also as far as the e-collar stuff um i'd be looking for an immaculate heel not like oh that's pretty good i mean every time we have a client that comes in for a touch-up or a dog we're working on that's got reactivity issues the first thing what's the first thing that we always do when we're on the walk what do we look for the heel absolutely yeah. and how, did, how good does it have to be perfect perfect why? Because that's the first step. If you can't get that right, then you can't expect them to react well around other dogs. Nice work. Nice work. And, and if, if they're pulling at all, even if there's no tension on the leash, if you're asking your dog to be like head, I, we ask for a, a tougher thing because it's harder work for the dog, which means the dog has less mental energy to focus elsewhere. So I ask for the dog's head to be parallel with the hip. And if the dog wants to push against that, then that's a, that's a, a moment of a, a moment of contention where you're saying hey I want this and your dog's saying but I want this and if you can't get that like Laura was saying then you really are gonna have a very hard time getting the reactivity stuff getting your dog to buy in if you can't get him to buy in for this smaller moment so I'd be busting your dog's butt with like the world's most immaculate heel and you can you know walk heel dog's got to be right here any movement out high level correction get your butt back there I've trained you fairly do not get out of this space then you can actually slow down dramatically. Don't stop, but slow down. If your dog doesn't slow down with you, pop correction, repeat the command, heal at the same time, excuse me. And that's how you keep your dog focused. Like, oh man, it's not this heel thing isn't just like a, a walk through the park. This heel thing is work. I've gotta be really present and focused on what my owner's doing rather than like sending out all this bad juju to all these other dogs and stuff like that. So that would be a, a huge component. And you've heard me probably say, if you listen to these other answers, that's it's the thread or theme going through all of these all of these um, answers is that this foundation work and looking for small moments and going after those small moments firmly is where the answer is at nine times out of ten, and if you don't, what happens is these moments are stacking, right? This moment of like your dog pulling a little bit on the leash or staring at a dog just for a second too long and you don't notice it or don't correct firmly enough, and then it stacks to here and then and then gets to a point where you can't get your dog back. So. Foundation work inside the house, high levels of accountability, um, crazy good work with thresholds and heel, like we explained in the earlier question to the other, the other, um, the other um, person, and then um, and then as far as the actual interactions, if you've got the immaculate heel and the immaculate thresholds, and you're walking and your dog sees another dog, what we try and do is we don't go the other direction. Um, what I'll try and do is create a little bubble around, like just an extra, whatever it takes, right? So it depends on the other dog. If the other dog's a snotty, bratty dog, then you're probably gonna need more space initially in order to keep your dog from exploding. Um, and what we do is we're, we correct for looking, right? So uh, we correct for, you know, dogs are like this, ears back, foreheads relaxed on the pity, and all of a sudden ears come up, foreheads wrinkled, like, can my hat won't do it, foreheads wrinkled like that. Um, that's where we correct. We don't correct for, is the dog gonna bark? Is the dog gonna pull? Is the dog gonna lunge? It's too late then. What you wanna correct for is, right, the, the, the first moment of intensity and the staring, pop, don't do that. So we'll just say no and correct. And you know that you're at the right level when the dog's state changes, not just that the dog like looks away and then looks right back. You're looking for the dog ears to go back, dog to relax, dog to be out of that space. Now that said, we let the dog tell us what level is, is the appropriate level for those corrections, but we're also highly conscious of space so we don't pressure cook the dog or you, the, 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 the handler, when you're trying to get these skills and your timing together. So um, that means you have to create enough space around dogs to where you guys can be successful. Now, whether that's four feet, 10 feet, 25 feet, I don't know your skill level and I don't know your dog's reactivity level. And then I, of course, I don't know what the other dog walking towards you is like either, but all of those are factors in this. So you have to factor them all in. Snotty dog coming towards you, you need more space. Um, and in order to be successful and more calmer dog, you can be a little bit closer. Um, but I would be starting easy like that and make it easy for both of you and go for all of these foundational things to create leverage, stack them up, and then your dog starts to get reactive, you know, like, like just like we said with the shepherd. If your dog 
pulls even the teeniest bit through a threshold or mm -hmm. the teeniest bit on heel or the first time glances at the other dog, I would correct firmly, probably more firmly than what you're expecting yeah. in order to cap that intensity and bring the dog back down when he's at a small, when he's at a one or a two, so you don't ever see four, five, or six. Mm -hmm. And of course you can do like, you can recall the dog away from the dog. Like uh, we have a friend named Ty who does like thing like a step back recall. You can recall the dog back away, like a couple feet back to you. But typically that's just gonna break, it might work for Ty, but I think a lot of times it's going to uh, kind of break focus. But uh, I don't know if it's actually going to address that situation and cause the dog to change his decision making. So, but it's something you can try and see see if it works for you. But typically that's not what we do. We just do, um, we, we correct for uh, state of mind change and get the dog right back to ground zero to where he's just relaxed, forehead's not wrinkled. If he stares, pop, no, simultaneously, no. Dog comes back to relaxation and keep walking. Okay, question number six. Nope, not you, Kate. <laughs> Okay. Whoa. I got, I got to over there. You guys Kate Webb. Content. Kate. Yeah. Hey. Kate says, Hi, Sean and Laura. I'm writing from Brisbane, Australia. Oh, I love Brisbane. Me too. Lots of summer thunderstorms up here. A general question. Do you see thunderstorm anxiety in dogs that are managed under your program of structure, leadership, and duration? Haven't seen you mention it in your vids. Is the answer in a combination of teaching the dog to be calm in general life and having the crate in a safe place where the dog's anxieties don't escalate? My two GSDs are fine with loud noises and thunderstorms. I'm just interested as it is a widespread problem for friends with pets and there are many anti-anxiety remedies out there. I'm holding back as much as I can from saying good day. Which is probably say good, it. Right? No, just no, say no, it. I can't, I can't say it good. So anyways, Katie, Katie I'm going to spare you that. Um, is, is Brisbane? Brisbane's on... No, but is that where they have all the bats? Oh. Katie, know. you'll have to respond back. Uh, I've had I had bats on the Gold Coast. Yeah, but there's a very famous like at at, at um, dusk in this one spot where we were staying. I thought it was in Brisbane, where um, the bats come out and it's just a huge. That's actually like, I think it might just be Australia. What really? I it happened on the Gold Coast they all a, the they time. Have a bat issue. They had a bat issue. Um, and also, do you have like big botanical gardens there? I think I think there is in in Brisbane. I think she's asking about thunder. Sorry, I just I, well, I love the place too, and I just I'm, I'm just it's taking me back. Anyways, okay, I'm I'm coming back. So uh, so Katie, um, thunderstorms we don't really get them here. Um, I can't remember the last time we had one, so it's not something we get to practice on very often. Um, so I know like where my folks live in Arizona, they get a lot of uh, thunderstorms, things like that. So trainers that are in those areas probably have more information and more, more history with that stuff. Um, that said, um, you know, leadership, structure, rules, all of that stuff will absolutely help. Um, will it fix a problem? I can't say, I don't know how serious a, you know, the dog is, but it fixes a lot of problems or makes a lot of problems a lot better. So if it was my dog, it would absolutely be part of the program. Um, and then we'd have to see where it would get us to. If it's a, I mean, some dogs have really intense phobias. Um, thunder jackets, things like that can help for some dogs. Um, and then the sensitization stuff where, you know, using, uh, using CDs or, you know, computer um, sound effect of, of whatever it is that, that triggers the dog and then slowly using, you know, lower sounds to, to louder sounds and, and you can use food to counter condition, um, things like that. But uh, hard to say because we don't get much of that. But we do get a lot of dog reactive pitties. <laughs> uh, okay. Good day. Good day. Okay, this next question is from Cindy Viola, and I think piggybacking on there is Ashley Johnson Curtis. Yes. Um, so I'll ask Cindy's. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We'll just so piggyback. Cindy, what do I do with a dog with terrible separation anxiety? I've tried walking him before leaving the house, buying Kongs, but inevitably when I get home, there's something we've forgotten to move on the floor is destroyed. Mm. It usually happens right after I leave. Do you think he needs to be crated? He's a one-year-old boxer Frenchie mix and is fully potty trained. I also have an 11-year-old Boston who doesn't do any of those things. Why isn't she teaching him good manners? That is a great question. Yeah. Um, so, and Ashley Johnson Curtis also has. So uh, we we'll get. Let's answer that one skate. second. Okay. So, um, so Laura, when would you say that a client doesn't need a crate anymore? Uh, well, I mean. 
Well, this is kind of a tricky one because I crate Hercules mm -hmm. always when I leave. Yeah. He's always in the crate. But he's fine. He doesn't destruct or soil. Yeah. And he's balanced for the most part. Yeah. So, I mean, we use we use the crate. You're great. Okay. Keep rocking. We use the crate for, for um, not just if a dog destructs or soils. Like if you had a totally balanced dog that wasn't in the crate but was destructing or soiling, we'd say use the crate until that's not an issue anymore. But if you have a non-balanced dog, we're using the crate. What? <laughs> Since you can say no, you can say that if the dog destructs, I just keep picturing an exploding oh, dog. <laughs> Self destruct. <laughs> Gotta put him in yeah. the crate. He explodes. If you if you have a a non-balanced dog, then we use the crate as as leverage to um, have some structure while we're not there. So I would say it depends on the dog. With this dog, the dog, especially a one-year-old. Boxer mix that's pulling the house apart definitely needs to be in the crate and not just stuffed in there, but with a whole bunch of foundation behind it so that you don't find a, a, a mess of crate by the time you come back. Yeah, yeah. So that Laura, Laura said pretty much what I was going to say, which is that the dog should absolutely be in a crate. And the rule is what I was fishing for, but she made uh -oh. me work for it. Sorry. It was just that, you know, if the dog is soiling or the dog is destructing, um, then the dog should be in a crate, absolutely. Of course, there's a lot of other dogs that we recommend for other behavioral issues that are in crates as well. But um, your guy would definitely recommend crating up. Um, mm -hmm. you can, he can actually ingest something and, and you know have a costly uh, surgery or even die from it. So that's another huge consideration. So, um, <clears throat> and like Laura said, all sorts of foundation work rather than just stuffing the dog in when into the crate when you wanna leave. And then having the you know the crate bars all bent and tweaked out, and the dog trying to get out. So, state of mind is a holistic thing. So you want to go you know go into our do-it-yourself videos on the website and start knocking things out. Like at least, it, it, like it's the dog survival guide is duration, place, command, thresholds, um, heel, the heel structured walk, and then. Um, that, that would be like if you that would be the bare minimum and then be really cautious about uh, you know excited departures or arrivals and you know a ton of unearned infection and stuff like that so that's my answer for Cindy and now we've got Ashley Johnson Johnston yeah uh, slash Curtis she basically said we have a foster dog she's really good about eating and sleeping in her crate but when everyone leaves she tears through it trying to escape how do we keep her from wanting to get out when no one is around okay so um, Ashley, one of the, the first things I do is I'd reinforce the crate. So any dog that has a propensity to try and break out of the crate, if there's any give in the crate, and a lot of the crates these days have got, got pretty good give, um, especially with stronger dogs, they can, they can pull them apart. Um, and then just like us, if you're doing a task and you feel like you're, you're making some headway and some success with it, you stay on that task. If you're on a task and it's like, this is hopeless, you tend to give up. So one of the strategies we do is make sure we really, really, really reinforce that crate to where the dog doesn't have any, the crate doesn't have any give, so the dog doesn't have any success or progress. Um, you can pick up zip ties at um, hardware store. And zip ties are those little plastic things that I don't know we use for all sorts of different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they like, they go, and you can lock them, you know, however tight you want them to be. Um, but we put those in all the joints on the crate where uh, the crate could come apart. So you might have six of them and crate the, and, and the other, the second door, you know, cinch that shut with a, with a few of them. And then at the hardware store, store while you're store. there, store, um, <laughs> while you're there, get um, some of the leash clips, which um, are at the end of the leash, you know, with the little spring loaded and like that, uh, leash clips, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, they sell them, you know, you can grab a handful of them and grab like four of those, five of those, and use those to clip the actual door that your dog goes in and out of. So that'll reinforce the crate. So the goal is that your dog like, ah, oh, push against this. No, oh, man, I'm not getting anywhere and gives up. So that's, uh, that's one answer for that. Um, I had a couple of the notes. What was I gonna say? Um, do -ka -do -ka -do -ka -do. Bear with me. Um, oh yeah, and so so practice, you know, practice having the dog. I think she said the dog was good in the crate when they're there, like mm -hmm. uh, eats in the crate, sleeps in the crate. So I'd be practicing with your dog, like simulating 
you not being there, like put the dog in another room, um, getting the dog to practice separation, um, you know, while you're still there, um, getting, getting the dog to do um, downstays with the crate door open inside the crate, um, but like put the dog in a back room in the crate and get the dog used to that. Um, you can still hear the sounds of you guys, put music on, things like that to help a little bit. Um, and then foundation work, just like what I've said to everybody else um, to get the mind right. So the basic, you know, heel thresholds, place command, at least um, get the get the mind right. And then a lot of that stuff should get better. So the answer for Cindy and Ashley. Natasha Radovsky. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha. No extra charge for the, for the accent. <laughs> Question eight. Hi, Sean and Laura. I love your Q&A forum and find your videos extremely educational. Oh, thanks. Donka. Donka. Wrong country. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the wrong continent, right? We're talking Russia and Scandinavia? <laughs> Quiet. Quiet, you. <laughs> right? it's, it's not just the sun Here's coming my you. question. When going to dog parks and other areas where dogs play off leash, my 18 month old male lab is nice with other dogs and wants to play. Mm -hmm. However, dun -dun -dun -dun, he has a tendency to put his front paws on other dogs and it gets dogs upset. Oh. Sometimes he tries to hump other dogs and I'd like to teach him not to do it. He's wearing an e-collar and I don't hesitate to use it, but I don't know how to correct him because I fear if I push the button at the moment when his paws touch another dog, he'll think the other dog bit him and will get aggressive. What do I do? Natasha Radovsky. Radovsky. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, Natasha. She, she's never, she's yeah, going to turn it, it off. Yeah, like. she's like, I've had enough of you guys. Um, <laughs> just, I'm moving back to Sweden. Where they say Danka. No, that's Germany. <laughs> right? What am I? <laughs> it's not just the light. <laughs> uh, Get out of here. Right? Tuck. Tuck. To some tuck. Tuck. Tuck them out. In Sweden. Uh, you guys have a terrible accent, so I'm not Swedish. I'd say Norwegian. that. What's Norwegian sound like? Tuck. Yeah, like Danish tuck. Mm. Anyways, Danish <laughs> is tuck. <laughs> That's what you guys all say. <laughs> um, you're just mad because they used to, you know, subject all of you guys. And no, I'm just all mad because they make the best pastries. Okay. And that's why I'm fat. <laughs> Danke. Danke schon. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anyway, so we've proven through this question we don't know where the hell we are geographically <laughs> or what's going on. So we should have stayed in school. Okay. Anyways, okay. So um, humping, paws on the other dogs, correct? Awesome that you've got a, your dog already on e collar. Yeah. So that really like helps us immensely. Um, so if you if you condition your dog properly to the e collar and like you say you're not afraid to use it, so that means your dog is used to the e-collar and knows that the e-collar comes from you and that the e-collar is not coming from another dog. The, the problem that with e-collar stuff is when, when manufacturers warn about not using it around other dogs is they're warning, and other trainers say that, they're warning you so you don't put it on a dog that's got dog aggression and then try and correct that and then the dog has no idea what the collar means or where the stem is coming from and then the dog does in fact think that it's coming from the other dog. So um, the fact that you condition it uh, conditioned it already and have the dog on e-collar is great stuff. So that means that we've got a pretty good strategy foundation in place. And so what I'll do is give you a few pointers for that, which is, so if you're going out to the, I mean, I don't recommend dog parks just for this kind of stuff because it, it's a zoo out there. Um, did she say dog parks or just off leash with friends? I don't want to yell at her. She's... Uh... It might be dog parks. It might be dog parks, all right. If it's dog parks, you got to be careful because uh, you can get some pretty nasty fights there and you can end up with a pretty dog reactive or dog aggressive dog. So not to burst your bubble, but that's something I'm pretty pretty careful with. Anyways, so um, e-collar on and um, what I would do is I'd stay kind of close to your dog and um, not so close that he won't do the behavior, but close enough to where you're in a good... Um, verbal range where he can hear you and then what I would do is when your dog begins to do any of these behaviors whether it's humping or legs up I would dial down a little bit and uh, so say I don't know what, e what kind of e-collar you're on but say you're correcting it at 20 right or yes yeah, so say it's say it's 20 or if you've only got eight levels say you're at a at a three or a four or something like that then I would probably correct it like um, 10 or like a one something to start, right? Just 
so what what you don't want to do is you don't want while the dog's like engaged with another dog to like blow your dog's mind and cause your dog to be so nervous about the correction that he he forgets about being conditioned to the collar and he's like god what was that and i'm just so worked up so that's the one instance where you could in my opinion possibly get yourself into trouble so i, I do it all the time um but i'm just cautious about it i make sure you know if the dog's doing it i lay a verbal no on the dog if i'm close enough to where the dog knows it's coming from me and then i try and correct a little bit lower and then move it up if the dog isn't responsive so but typically, if you've conditioned the dog, the dog knows pretty darn precisely that it's coming from you. It's not coming from another dog. So I'd say you're probably set up pretty good to not have any issues with that. But the second you see the paw go up, or the second you even see the posturing, you know, yeah. like the second your dog like starts to posture and like get like this around the other dog, pop, knock it off. No, right? So start at a lower level, see what you get. And if you correct a little bit lower and your dog doesn't get the message, then come up a little bit, repeat the command, keep your voice nice and neutral, don't add any heat to uh, to the fire, any any fuel, don't like, no, just no, and just make sure it's loud enough for him to hear, and then let him let him tell you what level works when he's, and he'll stop the behavior. You should be fine though, so uh, okay. just keep yourself cool, and don't like, don't start with the, the skyrocket high levels to, to do that. Cool? Cool. Cool. Bonka. Okay, question number nine. This is Susie Blue. Oh, Susie Blue. I have to. Oh my gosh. I have to Dunka. yell this whole question. <laughs> so, so we might want to have a little talk with Susie Blue about I have to the, yell the caps. The caps Susie. lie. Susie. Our dog chases our dog <laughs> and barks a high pitched bark in the house, especially in the bathroom. The bedroom and right outside the back door. I think Susie just got it stuck. It's I bet what happened was Susie had the caps lock key on and started writing, wrote the whole thing without looking, and then she looked up and she's like, "Damn it!" And then she like sent it anyway. It's a lot of work. Yeah, just send it out. <laughs> exactly. All right, Susie, we love you. Um, okay, she says our dog chases our tail and barks a high pitched bark in the house. It's our tail. <laughs> it's our tail. Hey. Especially in the bathroom, the bedroom, and right outside the back door. So mm -hmm. barking high pitched. Sometimes it seems she's triggered by people returning home, but it's also hard to tell what triggers her at other times. She also chases shadows and light. She mm -hmm. gets a good amount of exercise, including a daily run, mm -hmm. games in the house, puzzles, etc. It's clear she's very intelligent and possibly bored, but it's also the skittish sort. She's a rescue and we've worked through much with her, but the tail and shadow chasing barking hasn't changed much what would you suggest we do when those behaviors start off with the tail it's so easy it's so just take easy. that tail off yep. so it, the chasing is done mm -hmm. um but seriously okay so ocd and skittish behavior stuff um we see a lot of that stuff and um honestly what i would do is i would i would start to shift your focus a little bit away from high intensity puzzles, games, activity, activity. I, I, I get the strategy and that's a lot of the information that's floating around out there is you got to stimulate, you got to stimulate, you got to wear the dog out. But the, the truth is you're not calming your dog down and you're not slowing the mind down. So you need to do some calming exercises. You can, you can still have some fun and, and do some exercise and do all that and have puzzles and things like that. But I would say you need to focus way more on duration work get that dog in place command tell him to zip it up and don't move no matter what's going on around him and sit tight for two hours right there buddy that's that's and and correct for for breaking the command so now that said you have to have a training tool to be able to do that so i would bless you i would say leash and prong at the very least to get started with that and uh, the leash and prong is on your dog um, whenever you're home supervising and your dog's dragging the leash around so you have a way to communicate with them. And uh, you can just go through our foundation videos which are on the website, www.thegooddog.net, uh, free instructional do-it-yourself videos, something like that, and start working through those. Your dog needs a lot of quiet time, a lot of downtime, a lot of chill time he doesn't need all this activity stuff is just revving your dog up so you can have that but you sure as heck better get a whole lot of the other side of it which is just quiet chill now the only real value that comes from duration work is when your dog finally gives in and buys into it if he's in place and breaks constantly 
you haven't gotten there and you haven't gotten your value yet. So you really got to focus on getting your dog to just chill out, lay down in place and be quiet. And we're looking for quiet up here, not just quiet here, really quiet, quiet the mind down. You should see a lot of that stuff go away. Um, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we don't have some magic method for counter conditioning OCD stuff. We just get the mind calmer, relaxed, chilled out, and we almost always see that stuff go away. Mm -hmm. So uh, less activity, uh, more duration work, um, leash and prong. Those are the notes I have for you, and that's what we just covered. Yeah. All right, question 10. This comes from Instagram. This is from handle Trooper and Mo. Mm -hmm. My dog Trooper has a barking problem. If he hears any noise outside, he goes crazy and won't stop barking. We also have a pack of coyotes in our area at night that gets him riled up at 3 a.m. and oh, he won't tough. calm down. Trooper is kept inside and we've tried correcting this on our own. Long downstays, crating, pet corrector, bark collars, but with minimal success. We live in a small attached condo and I'm worried our new neighbors are going to complain. Mm. Any suggestions are appreciated. Okay, Trooper and Mo. Um... So you tried a lot of stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, that's a really tough situation with the coyotes around that freaks yeah. so many dogs out. It's a it's a really tough one. Um, but my solution would be kind of a simple one, and that would be to go to a remote collar. It sounds like you're saying that this is happening while you guys are actually present. So that's kind of a good situation. If you're concerned about the dog's behavior when you're present, <clears throat> then a remote collar is great because it can actually trigger more accurately and you can customize the stimulation um, in the moment where you can't do that with a no bark collar. And a lot of the no bark collars, especially like big box stores, uh, no bark collars are, are no good. So um, I would, if I was you, I would get online, go to Amazon, get an e-collar technologies um, educator mini 300. Um, they're not very expensive. They're under 200 bucks. Yeah, 180. 180 bucks. Um, they're simple to use. They've got a half mile range. Um, should go through um, doors, walls, things like that. You know, in your small place, you should have no problem. And um, continue to do all the other foundational work that you're doing. Um, you could add the e collar to it if you wanted to get fancy, um, which would be really great for your dog. Um, but then you, I mean, you've already been using the. Um, the no bark collar so your dog's already used to um, e-collar stimulation correction stuff so I would use the remote collar um, you know if you're in the living room and your dog is barking in the other room or in the living room with you and barking and it's about the coyotes or whatever it is um, I would I would go after that pretty firmly with the, the uh, remote collar um, but I'd also want to give the dog a uh, in, in a perfect world, because I've got that video actually on, on our website, the um, e-collar place command video, you could teach your dog e-collar place and then get some duration work that's e-collar enforced, which will help slow the mind down when that stuff's going on. I know you've been doing that already, but you haven't been doing it with the e-collar. So you could use the e-collar to enforce place and then correct the dog while he's in place for any barking, whining, or carrying on, and that should help the dog calm down considerably. If you don't break that cycle of barking, um, then your, your dog's gonna be kind of stuck. And so pet convincer uh, is cool for some dogs, but for a lot of dogs with intense stuff, it's not, it doesn't have enough value. No bark can be cool, but for a lot of times they don't trigger. Um, they don't trigger appropriately, or they don't trigger enough. Um, that's if I've got dogs that have you know got anything going on I'm working with I, I go to a remote collar and I'll just do the correcting myself um, so I can more customize it so that would be my suggestion order that baby up and um, put it on your dog and then um, uh, read all the read all the instructions <laughs> make sure you do it right because um, e-collar uh, the educator does have a boost mechanism and you don't want to hit the boost button if you're not trying to so um, just be cautious about that and that would be it. I would see what you get with that. I think you could actually probably knock it out. I think this is probably your your answer that you haven't tried yet. And um, sorry to lay another financial <laughs> thing on you after you tried a bunch of stuff, but that would be absolutely, if, if I have barking dogs um, and I didn't have a remote collar to deal with it, I would my hair would all fall out and I would lose my mind because no bark collars work for certain things, but there's a lot of things they don't cover. Yeah. And uh, remote's going to be far better at that. So that is what I would suggest. What awesome. Think? Yeah. How, how was this episode? This was great. I mean, this is going to be a shorter one than last week for sure. 
awesome. That's a it's a rarity when That's I a rarity. zip it up a little quicker. Yeah, and you, move through things. you did awesome. I'm hauling butt today. We're definitely we 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 started a new program here at the Good Dog. A lot of, uh, I mean, we have pretty good time management on our own, but sometimes when we get together here at the Good Dog, we have trouble getting time management stuff mm. in order. So we decided this time to really. I don't know why. I just wanted to share a little bit about our life. It's good. good. Yeah. So wish us luck on that. We have. What are you talking of... about, by the way? Time management. Yeah, like our new like. Yeah, new schedule, oh, new yeah. structure. Like I say, okay, we're gonna finish this by this. We're gonna start yeah. this by this. She's, and... she's the uh, she's the the time Gestapo. She's mm-hmm. she's keeping us uh, in line here, which is which is awesome because um, that's probably my biggest my biggest challenge is I'm really good at at macro and and doing a lot of a uh, lot of stuff, but. Uh, juggling time and discerning when to switch gears is is not my strong point but it is hers and so together we will have one one brain that will overcome so uh it's exciting so hopefully um you know wish us well as we as we fine-tune our gig here and yeah. uh, keep improving we'll let you guys know how it's going yeah you'll see like q a saturday next next week will look like this <laughs> never all right, guys. All right, Thanks. guys. Thanks Thank so much. You. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, we really appreciate you. Yeah, Take care. We love the questions. Keep, keep them coming. Yeah, keep them coming. Okay, bye. bye.